Good morning. Thanks for coming, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce this morning uh, Dr. Jim Patton. He's a professor of bioengineering at the University of Illinois Chicago and Northwestern, and an investigator at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. And once Dominique's done, I'll let him introduce uh, the rest of his research to you. So thank you very much for joining us and, and talking about what you're doing. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much. There's lots of lots of nice familiar faces and other faces that uh, aren't so familiar, but I know and I have great respect for and uh, a lot of new friends. So it's great to to be here and, and, and to come back. I haven't been here in a while, so it's nice. It's nice to come back and see Cleveland. It's all we're always watching you from Chicago. Um, we're not just sending our weather your way. We're actually we're actually watching uh, and uh, have great respect for everything going on here. I think it's the best example of a collaborative crosstown collaboration that I've that I've ever seen, uh, and uh, and I think I think it's an inspiration. Uh, let's see. So I have to tell you a, a little bit about where I am, um, and forgive me if I'm pounding our great new uh, palace that we've built in Chicago into your heads. Uh, I don't mean to do that, uh, but I, I want to brag about it a little bit because I think it's instrumental to some of the research we're going to do in the future. Um, I, I'm at the robotics group, which is a group of professors at, that are part of the Ability Lab. And the Ability Lab is the name of the, the new hospital um, that has replaced the, uh, the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. Uh, and then I, I also wear several other hats. We run the, uh, the Mars Center, which is the, one of the uh, RERC grants from the Neidler uh, Institute, uh, which is part of now the, the uh, ACL division of the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and Mars is actually uh, the National Center for uh, um, rehabilitation robotics. So I like to play with robots, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, and then I'm a professor at UIC. I also hold some positions at uh, Northwestern and teach a little bit there. And then, uh, and then I also am heavily involved with the IEEE. Uh, so please, if anybody's interested uh, uh, in, in becoming more involved with the biomedical engineering uh, division of IEEE, which is called EMB, I'd love to talk to you and uh, get you to help uh, uh, with uh, things like editorial and uh, participating in the, in the conferences and things like that. OK, so um, what am I here to talk about today? Uh, I'm, I, I want to. I present to you this idea of a new space as kind of a little bit of a stage uh, for, for some of this stuff. So about eight years ago, people that I didn't even know ha ex with, with job uh, descriptions that I didn't even know existed started coming to our lab meetings and asking us questions about how we conducted ourselves. And it was because they were considering building a new hospital and they wanted us to give them ideas. So this is actually something I wrote uh, uh, many, many, many years ago, and I saved it. I actually, or actually, I took a picture of it uh, at the time, and it was the idea that we were going to envision the, the great new place of the future. And so what we ended up with is this new Ability Lab. And actually, the, the important thing to say is that, actually not on this figure, but, uh, but on the next one, um, my office is actually right, right in the back here, uh, right in the middle. Um, and actually, it's not an office. I just have a desk, and it's out in the middle of the space. And it's completely distracting, and so we have to handle all the problems associated with open office. But now this is not open office. This is open lab, open therapy clinic, open office, all in one. Um, so these are actual patients using this big stairway, for example, as a therapy tool. And it's also uh, an idea. Uh, that uh, is, is, is really amazing, is bathe everybody in the same environment all the time and have everybody talking to each other. So rather than have to go to another building or uh, maybe uh, avoid people that you don't like, you have, to, you have to actually look at them all the time and talk to them all the time. Right? So that's kind of a nice idea. And, and, it, and it's, it's, it's allowing us a little bit of, of new frontiers. So I'll talk about that in a minute. And it's, and it's exciting. And of course, there's a wonderful 
floor to ceiling, two story window looking out on Lake Michigan too, to kind of allow you to be distracted every once in a while. So, so what am I talking about? Well, I have, uh, I wanna uh, make, make this point and it's, it's these things. I, I you know, turned 50 a little while ago and I have to use these stupid reading glasses that I buy at Walgreens for $2. Um, I have to use them now. And they're an interesting proposition that uh, is, is, is great to make a point with. And it's the idea that um, what I'm interested in is a therapeutic intervention. And this is not a therapeutic intervention. There, there's a lot of things in the world like this. These help me tremendously. But when I take them off after wearing them all day, I can't see any better. So it's not the therapy proposition that we're looking for. And I, I would say that there are a lot of rehabilitation tools where we lose sight of this, this issue, this issue of sitting in a chair, sitting in a wheelchair does not make you better at walking later. Uh, even using a cane doesn't make you better at walking later. In fact, a lot of people would use the term crutch effect, the, this idea that I might not, uh, might not be able to walk as well if I depend on my crutch too much, right? So um, th this, this idea is a, a good idea if maybe you, you are getting over the hump and you can practice where otherwise you couldn't, but otherwise, I want to talk about the, the, front, the frontier of actually doing something to a patient so that they can eventually walk away from the technology and actually be better. That's the interesting idea. So we call this the liberation proposition, the idea that I want to be liberated from the technology after having an experience with it and be different and be better. And, and sometimes that's an interesting idea uh, with, with so, uh, these therapy tools and these uh, fancy technology that people are inventing. And sometimes we've, we lose sight of that, the fact that it may be a whole different program if you're using it. So I'm going to tell you about some of the ideas there. But first, I want to uh, plug Pat, right? So he's, he's uh, I think, one of the people listed on here that I've, uh, I, I got some of the sources from here. But this is a really boring slide. But it sets the stage. And this, the stage is that we have this nervous system that is really controlling this very complicated set of mechanical things when we're trying to move and sense and do things. And it's ridiculously slow. So because it's so slow, we do, uh, we do things like uh, reach for our cup of coffee. And by the time my hand is most of the way to my cup of coffee, uh, I have maybe started to have some sensory information arrive telling me that I'm maybe missing my target and I need to fix that. It's already too late. So we move very fast compared to the speed of our nervous system. And because of that, we need other tools. Um, and these tools don't uh, exist very often in industrial robotics and fancy uh, robots that are controlled by electrons on wires because they're fast. We're slow, and this is how we handle speed. And this, the way we handle speed is we plan ahead. And, and if you think about what that means, that means you have to have an experience, maybe, that has told you how to plan ahead. You have to have learned that. You have to have acquired that. And that means that you also have to have uh, uh, maybe a memory of what's going on. And you have to store that memory in what very often we call internal models. So many of us here know exactly what I'm talking about when I say internal models. There's a lot, about, a lot of literature on this. Um, and it's maybe also called feed-forward uh, control. It's also uh, very important uh, because we think that it's acquired gradually through repetitive practice and experience. And this is why you see infants uh, like, like Nate's baby, right, uh, waving the arm around a lot, trying to figure out how to move, and making flailing maybe errors and uh, mistakes, and then learning from. This is why we fall down a lot when we learn how to walk. Um, but it's also probably a mechanism, and I say a mechanism in, the, in recovery. Recovery is about learning how to drive your new brain. Um, and it's a brain that's maybe lost some parts, but not all of them, and you have to figure out what is now the appropriate signals to send down to the muscles rather than maybe the, uh, 
the, uh, the old motor pattern that is now trying to travel down on some wires that have actually been cut and some processors that are missing. Okay, so I'm not, uh, I'm very interested in stroke um, because I think that it's starting up at the top and it's a very interesting problem. So I like, uh, so forgive me those of you who really love uh, spinal cord injury, but I love problems above the neck um, is what I, what I like to say. So, um, so, the, so the long time spent on this slide, but the point is, is that, you know, you can, you can use this as, as a complicated system that you can maybe leverage. And then, of course, I want to talk about this process of learning as a, me as a mechanism of recovery. We also have a lot of other things that happen when people recover, hypertrophy, for example, and other, other aspects. But I'm really interested in the learning process, and I, I just want to think deeply about the learning process when we, when we talk about it. And then, of course, we have toys that can allow <coughs> I've got to make sure I, I'm looking at the right thing here. Toys that allow, um, and I'll turn down the Brazilian music that uh, my grad student put on this video, because I don't think any, nope, I'm turning it up. I didn't mean to do that. So, um, so the idea, of course, is that you want, you want a very versatile haptic graphic system maybe to study this. So keeping things simple, but also allowing three-dimensional head tracked virtual reality, uh, but also a robotic device that maybe someone is holding on to, or maybe it's tied to their hand, uh, and you know you can uh, pr program it. You get, you get young imaginative researchers to come into the lab and program it in a thousand different ways, building off of other programs that other people have used. And, and a lot of people have these kind of toys. I know, I know you have some here. Um, and, uh, but, but the idea here is to do it in the, the best possible way with the best possible robotic technology that you can actually program any type of force motion experience. So if you think about this, what this is is reality, uh, virtual reality. And it's virtual reality, of course, where, you, where you're rendering the sense of touch. We call it haptics, of course. And, uh, and then uh, the, uh, the next step is, what can you do with it? And uh, a lot of people would think, well, reality, reality is really cool to imitate. I would say w w we're having fun with this idea of distorting reality, this prospect of encouraging learning and changing the learning process by changing reality. And uh, you can do that with this. You can do it rapidly, and you can have a lot of fun with it. So that, almost all, that, that type of idea kind of can, can foster a lot of other ideas uh, just, by, just by saying it. And then if we ask the neurocomputational guys from, from, from the old days uh, how you describe all these learning mechanisms, I, you know, one way is to categorize them from the neural networks side of things, this idea of unsupervised learning or, or, uh, or uh, movement, repetitive movement kind of, uh, of processes. Um, and then there's reinforcement learning where you're basically rewarding after many tries or punishing, and then supervised. And many of you know exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about these three categories. Supervised is the one that I'm going to talk about first here. And I think this is an interesting idea, this idea of learning from mistakes. So if you're making mistakes, what's important is to focus on the error. Error is the tool that your learning system actually uses to change. Right? So um, this is the hot topic right now. This is the, uh, the deep learning. Uh, and other things that are in the news right now are using these kinds of mechanisms to get the job done. So um, the idea is to make, make sense of error. Um, there's been plenty of nice work on, on this. Here's one of my favorite papers uh, that was published a while back uh, that kind of talked about how the neural motor system might accomplish this. And it's a, it's a nice paper because what it, what it does is it actually says, how do you use learning and this feed forward process and the feedback processes that we also know are there and put them all together in a tunable adaptive system that is closely representative of what's going on in the brain? Um, and, and the rest of the nervous system. Okay, so having said that, I want to take a break. Okay, this is this is fun now to do this, right? Is to ask uh, to have a little quiz, right? So I've given one hint here, but the question is, who is this amazingly good-looking chap that we have on the board here? You know, and I'll and I'll remind you that there was a time where you kind of had to have a beard, I think, to be a cool researcher, right? Um, 
So this guy went crazy with the beard, right? And I hope I'm not insulting anybody with really bushy beards in here. No, I think everybody else, everybody in, with beards in here are, have tame beards, right? But uh, does anybody know who this is? Man, OK. You, are you, you hit, go ahead, guess. Bernstein. No, good guess. But because I think it does look like Bernstein a little bit, but it's not. And it, but it is a Russian. Yeah. Anyone else? OK, so can I give another hint? I'll give another hint. This is going to give it away. Yeah. Anybody remember the name? OK, this is, this is fun. I do, I do this with the students in my class. So, <laughs> we all, so does anybody remember the name? Oh, good. This is fun, because then I can, I can remind everybody. I love history of science, right? It's fun. No? OK, so this is Dmitry Mendeleev. You remember him? OK. So did you say it? Dominic said it, and he just was, he did, you didn't have enough courage to shout it, right? So, 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 <clears throat> so yeah, he's very shy. So, so why am I showing this guy? Well, he, he, you know, he's riding on a train in the middle of Europe on a cold night, and he had to take his notes with him. And he realized that on a train, it's hard to do. So what he did was he put it all on index cards. You know, remember index cards? We used to do this when we were in high school. He had them all on and cards, and he started laying them out on the train seat in front of him when he was uh, traveling. And he realized that there was a pattern and uh, thought about it for a while, probably fell asleep, and then woke back up again and thought about it some more, and actually started arranging them in a pattern and actually came up with this uh, structural pattern that described or predicted the behavior of all of these different elements that he knew about at the time. Now, that's n maybe not what you might call a model. But really, if you think about it, it is. It's a model of chemical structure and behavior, right? And the idea there is that uh, he, w he, he basically predicted elements that hadn't been discovered yet and was vindicated a few years later when they were discovered and they started putting holes in this table that were that he, he was showing. Um, and what he was doing was actually using this m modeling structure that he had developed to predict things that couldn't be uh, predicted, could, 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 that didn't exist at all. So you know, this is one abstraction of the idea of modeling, is can you use a model, whatever kind of model it might be, to structure and predict uh, the outcome of, of something new, right? So, um, now I'm going to take you back in time. So some of you should be grinning here because you're seeing um, an old paper that we all uh, have been forced to read, uh, but it led me to do a lot of my work that I'm doing. So this is Reza Shadmir and Sandra Musavaldi, who did this wonderful paper back in the 90s. Um, and, and the idea is you know, ask people to reach in movements to a target in, on the periphery. Um, so f those of you who know all about this, forgive me. I'll take you through it really quick, because this is going to be the model. This is going to set up the model that I want to talk about. Um, so you're asking people to reach in kind of center out reaching movements to different targets. And the targets really aren't shown here, sadly. But uh, you, know, you have this little target that you have to reach to. So you're looking down on the person um, while, they, while, they, while they move. And they're actually holding the handle of a robotic device that is not exerting any forces at all. So um, these wonderful robots that, uh, that are completely back drivable and transparent. Uh, or almost, uh, so they don't resist your emotion at all if you turn them, turn them down to zero torque, and then uh, and then what's interesting is you, you give them a force field. So the force field is a is basically a vector linear transformation on velocity. So this is the velocity x and y uh, of the hand, and this is a force that comes out, and you see this wacky 
crazy matrix that you're multiplying it through. For those of you who are, are really nerdy and know your linear algebra, you look at this and say, oh, I can do eigenvalue decomposition on this, and I know that the eigenvalues of this are both positive and negative. So it's both stable and unstable, depending on which way you move and all that stuff. So fancy engineering, but the point is that it really screws up your movement. So now you see these movements that are hook-shaped because people make horrible mistakes, and they can't reach normally. But they're in completely intrigued by it. And over repetitive practice uh, of training, uh, hundreds of movements, usually a, you know, about an hour of training, they actually recover their ability to move in a straight line without even being told to move in a straight line. All right, which is also a miracle that we move in straight lines. When, we, when I reach for my cup of coffee, I move my hand in a straight line. And that's mainly to keep it smooth so I don't spill. So, so that's neat. And, and then, of course, the, the next step is that you turn off the forces uh, suddenly. And what happens is people can't move normally again. So if you think about it, this is a bit like this liberation idea, right? I have taken away the force field experience of the robot, and I've returned the, the person to the normal world, and they can't move the way they started with before. This is great evidence that someone has learned, but it's also inspiring because if you can predict this process, you might be able to invert it, OK? And what does that mean? That means exploiting some sort of model, maybe, to do that. So um, here's the model as in the shortest form you can write it. What's, what's interesting about this is this is just the standard. For those of you who know robotic textbooks, this is the standard robotics equation. And this is the only equation I think I'll subject you to today, sorry. But uh, you know we have inertial, gyroscopic, uh, centripetal Coriolis. And then you have this uh, model of, of the world here. So this is actually this feed forward uh, controller here that's actually trying to imitate and understand what's going on, and then an impedance uh, element as well. So, so if you model that, and what's interesting about it is you can put it all together and just call it M and say it depends on a bunch of stuff. Um, so those of you who are computational people, you say, OK, this is a basis function, actually. But, uh, but what's interesting about this is that you can use this to predict the process. So what's, inter what's interesting about this is, is the, the compelling idea behind models is you can use them to ask new questions. You can say, what can I do with this model? Well, I want to invert it. So the question is, I don't want these after effects of adaptation to be just anything. I want them to be maybe a new movement that I decide ahead of time. And then I work backwards through this model and ask the question, what force should I give people? What, what set of forces should I give them? Um, and you can do that, which is really amazing. Not all the time can you invert a model and ask this question. But here we did. So I'm jumping ahead a lot because uh, I want to get to more stuff in, in, in this talk. So ask me about the steps along the way. We tested this on healthies, and we tried it on healthies. I can make a healthy person make a really squiggly movement that they're not even trying to make um, with this process. But here is a stroke patient, actually. So this is one example of one stroke patient. Um, we, pe we published this in JRRD in 20 2006, but, uh, so you can look for more. But, uh, but this is one example of one movement of one subject. And uh, there's a lot of steps in the process, but really quickly, this is the mistake they start with. This is what they tend to do. And these are repetitive uh, motions up and to the left in this case. So you're asking people to move uh, from this point out, in this case, to here. And then the, this, this particular patient in this particular movement direction makes this hooked. Uh, mistake. So the heavy blue line is meant to show the running mean of this person. Okay, and then we have a bunch of steps uh, where the robot is actually learning the model of the human, and uh, and then uh, we ask the model. Okay, now at this point, let's see where is it? Early training. We ask the model. What, what, is, what are the special forces for this particular patient in this particular movement direction that will actually cause them to have an after effect of adaptation that is appropriate? In other words, they, they move better. So what does it do? Well, it, it, these little green guys are forces 
That was, did you see that? That was Bill Gates doing something there. Um, uh, these little green guys are, are, and these are kind of hard to see, but those are force whiskers uh, showing the forces that we're pushing on this patient with. So for uh, 360 movements of practice, this patient is receiving these forces. And, and of course, the, the other thing to point out, whoops, is uh, the, the other thing to point out is that this is making them horribly worse, right? They're making much, more, much, much worse uh, mistake. Um, and they're not even getting to the target. And then they train. And they train and train and train. They don't even get that much better after training. So 360 movements later, this is the last five movements of that training session. And then what's important is right here, uh, we turn off the forces. And we see these nice after effects. And then more importantly, we leave them off. A healthy person would you know, maybe have this process screw up their movements and then we turn it off and they, they would wash out. But for some reason, uh, this person has seen the new way to move or something and, uh, and they, they actually hold on to this great uh, beneficial after effect. All right, so neat idea with modeling. So kind of to summarize the idea of the model, it's, it's actually take, take this model and and maybe do an inversion. There's lots of things you can do with models, and I, I love the philosophy of a model as a hypothesis and other things. But inversion is really an amazing thing. OK, so that's the engineering side of all of this. But what's really uh, interesting is, can you throw out the model or simplify the model now that you've got good results that actually have guided you through the woods, right? So I might sound like a hypocrite, because I'm going to try to cast away this complicated model, which takes a while to co compute and, and do on the computer, right? So what's next? Well, the real question is, how do you apply forces to get people to change? So I've shown you one. Um, I, I want to say we've, we've kind of explored this space quite a bit, and we have a whole bunch here. Um, and I'm going to tell you about uh, a couple of them. but. Ask me about these others if you if you if you want uh, some other time, and I and I'll and I'll tell you about them. We're playing around with lots of adventures. So if you think about it, it's about taking knowledge of neurophysiology and movement control, and maybe even some mechanics, and bringing uh, young imaginative people into the lab with ideas. And when we try try uh, try out. Uh, hypotheses based on this, on how to get someone to change the, the way they move. Um, so I want to talk about these two that I've circled here, because I, we're, we're very excited about them. And we currently have funding to talk about them. Right? So, so I, I'll talk about them, but uh, there's more. So, uh, so here's, here's another example of a subject in another study where we basically flipped the coin and we pushed people either so that we made their errors larger or we made their errors smaller, randomly choosing. And this is, this is subjects. So what I'm showing is an example, again, of a, very similar to the last one I showed, where this person is receiving forces that actually makes their original errors bigger. OK, so this is just an example. And in this case, we're asking people to move towards the, ch in, this, in this particular subject, in this particular movement direction, we're asking them to move towards the chest. Just, just another example. And a healthy person would make this nice uh, red dash line to a target here, where this person gets much bigger. And the green is actually showing forces that they're receiving in practice. And the important thing is that we see this uh, this recovery of movement uh, accuracy. Whoops, not yet. I've got to be careful. Uh, so so what's, what's important about all of this is that, uh, is that uh, you know, if you do a nice controlled study on this, we actually had a control group that received no forces. We had some that received forces that made their errors less. If you think about it, that's closer, close to guidance where I'm helping someone move better, move straighter. Um, it might be considered by some as what a therapist might want to do some of the time with a patient is actually help them move better uh, 
and guide their hand. And then we had this technique in this particular, like in this example. And we did it on many, uh, many subjects. And we found that the people who had training forces that magnified their error uh, are the ones on the right here. And then what I'm showing is how much better, as measured by their movement uh, straightness, how much better they got at, by the end of training. After we turned the forces off and left them off for a while, we did a measurement. Um, so we're, what we're seeing is that people benefit in this short-term adaptation study if they get forces that amplify their error. Okay. So that's wacky. Uh, it's, the, it's very counterintuitive. But it's a little bit like the, the drill sergeant or the, the tough coach, right? Uh, who's making life harder for you for a while in order for you to get better because they want to see you better. Tough love, right? Uh, so we're, amp we're, we're actually augmenting the error. And so this has been carried on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the clinical study that came after this. But uh, I, I wish I had more time. I could tell you all kinds of exciting things about this. But this was a long road to try this in earnest on stroke patients in a clinical intervention. This is a, uh, we tried to make it as close to a clinical trial as we possibly can as, uh, as, en as engineers and therapists all working together. So now we have this fancy three-dimensional thing. It's really hard to see here, isn't it? But what we have is a therapist and a patient working together. And I'm trying to show you from underneath what it looks like. But the therapist and the patient are working together. And they're sitting side by side. The therapist is holding onto a tracking device. And the tracking device is talking to the computer and putting a cursor in front of the patient. Okay, So the patient is trying to move and track that. Actually, I think, let's see, I keep hitting the wrong thing here. So this is actually what's seen. Uh, if It's very hard to show, show, it, uh, show what it looks like because it's uh, a, a virtual reality. So it's a left eye, right eye uh, image that we're seeing there. So this is what's actually being seen. The therapist is trying to track, the patient is trying to track the therapist's cue. So the therapist is choosing what therapy is happening that day. And then unbeknownst to everybody, including the operator of the machine who's an engineer sitting behind them, um, nobody knows whether we're turned on error augmentation or not. So error augmentation, what is it? It's In this case, we're multiplying any error that, w that they make instantaneously by 1.5. So you make a mistake in your error. Uh, you make an error to the right by two centimeters, you're going to see a cursor three centimeters over. Okay, So you're actually seeing a larger mistake than you actually are making. And it's done in real time. And then the, the other thing we're doing is pushing them. So we're giving them a little bit of a push that's proportional to their error in the direction of their error. Okay, So um, what do I mean by a little push? It's 400 newtons per meter. Uh, but, uh, times the error. OK, so you have to think about all of that. But it ends up, and then we actually cut it off so that it doesn't go too high. And we cut it off at about, uh, what do we cut it off at? Four newtons. So this is very small, very subtle forces. Four newtons is about, it's less than a pound, right? So the maximum they're ever going to see is, 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 is that, and, uh, and it's very subtle. In fact, it's very hard for me to even know whether I'm doing this to myself if I'm having it done. I can do little experiments because I know how it works. But uh, otherwise, if I'm just trying to track the target, even I have trouble. So nobody's, n nobody knows what's going on. And we could turn this on, turn it off, and then do a randomized placebo-controlled blinded study. And then we have a rater that's evaluating these people after they leave the machine and they're all done after two weeks. We can do uh, ratings of them outside of the machine uh, because we want to see how the experience with this device actually is influencing their ability to move in tasks that have nothing to do with the machine. So this is the idea of don't teach to the test, right? I don't want to train people to get better at running a virtual reality robotics machine. I want to train them to get better at life, right? So that's the idea. 
So lots of things to say, but um, in the end, you know, one is maybe, uh, and people might, those of you who, uh, who use the Fugelmeyer might argue with me is that this is a good outcome, but you know, people want to see it. So you can do a pre-post Fugelmeyer study, and this is just a taste of kind of some of the outcomes that we found. But what, what's important is that, you know, if you take all the subjects and look at their improvement, the subjects that over, and this is a two-week uh, intervention here, the subjects that uh, experienced error augmentation improved more, significantly more, than the subjects who didn't receive the error augmentation, the control group. Okay, so that's kind of uh, a little bit of, of this. And it's, it's not a huge effect. Um, we weren't looking for a huge effect. We were looking for a, a distinguishable effect between controls and, and, uh, and uh, treated, treated group over a short period of time. So, but that's exciting. So uh, it's very hard, uh, and there's been a lot of stroke rehabilitation therapy tests that have resulted in no significant effect. Uh, what, I, what I'm saying here is that this is one of those uh, rare studies that actually showed, showed an effect uh, where we actually show over and above uh, repetitive pra equivalent repetitive practice without error augmentation. Error augmentation gives them an advantage. Okay, so proof, no, but uh, n probably something a little bit exciting uh, about this idea. So what's, what's also nice that I want to mention here is that we're not eliminating the therapist from the therapy process, but instead enabling the therapist at, to, to do cooler, better, maybe more powerful things by Giving, bringing in some technology to, to the thing. So we call this a trio. I don't know. Uh, that's nice, but then I'm going to tear all of this nice thinking down uh, with the follow-up study we did, because of course the next step is to, is to realize that uh, hemiparetic stroke survivors have a healthier hand. So why not give the tracking device to the healthier hand and have them train themselves? So now the idea might be that you have uh, an upper extremity treadmill training device, I guess, is the way to think about this, right? Is now maybe it's possible for the patient to train themselves, at least some of the time. And what we found, this, the long and short of this is that um, we try to keep everything just about the same, except that now you're training yourself. And the important thing is that we did see similar benefits to error augmentation over and above, um, over and above the, the group that received uh, just uh, repetitive practice without it. And that's nice, but it wasn't as strong and it wasn't as clear. So it could be that actually therapists have some clear advantages over and above someone just being left alone on, to their own uh, devices to practice. Uh, but we're also excited about this because what we think about is this, this concept that my good, good colleague uh, Arun J. Raman at, uh, at the Ability Lab likes to talk about is this idea that there's so much downtime for these patients where they're watching TV or resting or uh, staring at the wall after they've had their therapy session. And if they want and they're ambitious, they can actually, they can actually be given something like this to go and try uh, alone and add to or uh, have more therapy uh, with this idea. So, you know, put this in the clinic and just leave it there, have it be ready for someone who wants to use it. Okay, we're playing around now with a follow-up study where we made this a little bit more interesting than just chase a target, because chasing a target for an hour is not really that much fun. Uh, it's kind of neat, but it's not as neat as maybe doing, doing some other stuff. So uh, we're working on that. But I want to change gears now in, in, the, la in the last few minutes, uh, talk about this idea of the unsupervised approach to, to things. And this, uh, this is the idea um, we're calling deficit fields. but uh, to know why it's called deficit fields, you have to stay with me for a few minutes. But it's the idea that maybe you want to ex improve someone's range of motion and actually just get them practicing moving on their own more 
right? So one way to think about that is that we've been pretty stupid with, with, uh, with our approaches to, uh, to this if we're just looking at reaching to a target, right? Um, so here's my good friend and colleague, Felix Huang, who works with me in, in the lab and is a great professor also, is this idea of just let people scribble everywhere over and over again for as much time as we can get them to do that. And then, you know, the nice thing about this is that computers are cheap and sensing devices are easy to do, and we can get lots and lots of data stored up on a patient um, by doing this. So, you know, ask someone to scribble and move a lot. And then what can you do? So, you know, John Krakauer at, uh, at Hopkins is calling this motor babbling. And it's a really nice idea, uh, maybe, to just getting people to move. OK, so enough about that. Let's, let me show you a figure here. Can I make this go? Yeah. So if you ask people to do this scribbling, and maybe just in a plane, we've done it in 3D as well. But the, in, in, in a plane, you can collect all this data and do something with it. You can actually fit it to a histogram, or if you're fancy, you can fit it to a, uh, a nice multi-Gaussian model um, and get this mountain landscape that is actually a characteristic description of a person's own abilities to move. So this is a nice idea. And um, it's, it's led to some really interesting thinking about this. Like, the first one is, uh, is that that mountain actually is something I can hand to a physician and say, this is what they can do today. They can reach to these spaces. And they, they, these, these hot areas is where they can go a lot. They have no trouble reaching here. And they go there a lot. They favor this area. But then they can't get out in this corner. And actually, that's an interesting idea. And what I really like about this is that, uh, and some of the neuro, neuroscientists might, might like this too is one of the things you can do is say, all right, this is a probability density function for what people can do and what their tendencies are and what their tendencies aren't. Um, all you have to do is divide by n, and you've got probability here. So where where are they probable? They're more probable to move where the red regions are, and they're less probable to move in the blue regions. But more importantly, if you take the slope of this which is easy to do if you fit it to a model and you've got multi, with multi-Gaussians. Gaussians are really easy to, to take the derivative of. You can take the gradient of this everywhere and turn this into a force field. right? So the gradient becomes the forces, the vector force field. Now, why would you do that? Well, what it means is that the slope down this hill, I want to push you down this hill. Why do I want to push you down this hill? Because you. You have no trouble being at the top of this hill. I want you to go to places that you haven't been, right? So I have this nice uh, vector force field that you can end up with uh, where, where you are pushed to places that you have trouble going to, and you're pushed away from places that you have no trouble going to, or, or you favor too much. OK, crazy stuff. I know, but then the next step is actually to go one step further is to say, well, we did this in the position domain where we're looking at where people go. Now I'd like to look in the velocity domain of, of how fast people can go. So what we're plotting here, and this actually just came out this week, this, uh, the, the paper on this in uh, Transactions in Neural Rehabilitation and Engineering uh, uh, that Zach, Zach uh, here has been working uh, very hard on for a few years. And, it, and it's the idea that you can actually do this in the velocity domain with a robot. So this is actually the vector field that you see for this particular subject. And they have uh, you know, a kind of a void out here. And so we, we're actually ushering them into areas that they couldn't move. So what we're doing is we're allowing people to freely move. And we're just distorting the mechanical world they're moving in a little bit to allow them to move to places that they maybe had trouble before. Um, I had we, we had no idea whether this would actually be beneficial for these patients. But weeks of practice show these nice improvements for some of the patients. And then for some of the patients, the low functioning ones, we see um, less benefit. Jim, can I ask a question? Yes, sure. I'm trying to understand. When you say that you 
you get these uh, profiles and you push the subject to areas where they're not going to. What do you mean by that? What, what exactly is the intervention when you say push? So, so these little, so for this particular subject, we're plotting velocity here. So when they return to this velocity right here, they're going to receive a force that is representative of this little teeny arrow in this position, right? And then when they move, that's going to maybe push them down here. And then they're going to receive forces according to this little arrow, which is less um, in this direction. And then finally, when they get out here, um, they're no longer being pushed, right? Because it's very small. So how, how is that to help me to resolve contradiction of what you said earlier, when you said that yeah. when somebody's out so one, there's always one smarty in the, in the group, right? Yeah. So, so just resolve that for me. So, so I would say there's, I, so first of all, I'd say never listen to anyone that contradicts themselves. <laughs> right? No, but uh, um, what, what, I, what I would say is you can have error, and error augmentation might help with your movement accuracy training and the mechanisms of learning in your nervous system that are actually associated with error, right? Or you might have this use-dependent learning mechanisms that uh, is a, uh, also being uh, supported by a lot of great researchers in rehabilitation now, where you just need to get moving, right? And you need to experience the movements. But w we, we struggled with how to get people to move to places where they maybe couldn't move without pushing them there, right? And, and those of us who have seen the locomat and know about the locomat, the locomat's a great walking device. I shouldn't badmouth it. But you know, my friend George Hornby had a locomat in his lab for a long time. And one of the things he discovered was that if you push people along a perfect trajectory, make them walk like a perfect Swiss male walker, which is what uh, all people in a locomat are doing, um, they, some of them fall asleep. They literally fall asleep walking. So you don't want to move someone for them to a place. So this is actually a bit like uh, a, a, a negative viscosity kind of, uh, uh, or what we call act, active impedance, where you're, you're actually allowed to move of your own accord, but you're still being helped. Um, so that's the idea. I don't know. That's a long answer to your question. I'm sorry. So and, and you know it's a wacky idea I, I know and uh, but we're seeing benefit from it. It's not it's not huge again. We're not hitting the ball out of the park, but we're actually showing nice nice benefits. And you know some of the some of the ways to measure how much better someone is 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 always is always a question. We we're in this field where our measures of outcome are some of the most challenging problems we have. Right? Is how do you measure good? Is, is not is not uh, not we don't have that many good tools for measuring good, so that kind of leads me into some other stuff. Um, so the, you know, the important thing also is that this is customized to the patient, but it's also maybe some one of the nice. Uh, specialized therapies that actually maps impairment to treatment, right? Which is what doctors do, right? This is the idea: diagnose and then treat. Have the treatment be uh, be guided by the diagnosis, right? Uh, but also, more importantly, this is maybe personal. This is this is robotic personalized healthcare, right? Now I'm getting um, now I'm going too far, right? So, um, but it, but it's a, it's a nice idea, and and also uh, daily uh, daily figures from each subject are really kind of informative too about how the person is is getting better. I'll encourage you all to look at the paper we just uh, published to see those. Okay, so I'm going to change gears one more time uh, with the last few minutes. How much time do I have? Should I be wrapping up? A few minutes, good. Okay, so here's here's. Uh, Here's, here's uh, the machine learning part of all of this, right? So I, I love all, all the new computational methods. Um, just a, a show of hands, who's playing with machine learning techniques that are out now? Is anybody? Uh, OK, so I mean, uh, some of them are really nice because they've been answering one really fundamental question I had way back when I was a, a grad student, which was, how do you build a regression model 
when there's so many ways you could do it with many, if you have a multi-factor model, right? There's all kinds of ways. How do you build one effectively uh, and include the factors that are important and, and remove the factors that are not important? And you know, when you start playing with that game, it's really hard. It's, uh, it's almost impossible. Uh, but the guys at Google have come up with some neat rules, and other, pla other places have come up with some neat rules. So this is part of that adventure. Um, and I'm really putting way too much up here. But one of the things you could do is you could scrutinize all the results we've gotten by putting them into a, a machine learning algorithm and saying, I don't know whether it was maybe that the patient uh, got better because of my therapy or the patient got better because they're older and I just have a low amount of subjects and the, the data collection process was capricious enough that I accidentally concluded one thing when I should have concluded another, right? So what do you attribute to the success and outcome of patients? So the idea here is, if you imagine, all I'm doing is I'm looking at the data from day one and saying, that's the only data I can hold on to right now. And other people are doing this. Now I'm looking back and I'm saying, if I knew only the data on day one, all the data, maybe from some measurements on the robot, maybe from things like uh, age and, and other factors. Um, can I predict the outcome weeks later? Uh, so that's what we're trying to do here. And this is one example. Um, and this is the Wolf Motor Function Exam, which is a nice functional score. And we saw some nice clean results. And you, know, you can put all of your data on here, but I'm hoping you can see the dots. So the dots are this huge repeat, repeated, uh, repeated uh, validation. So we're doing a lot of bootstrapping approaches to just saying, I don't know whether we've got, got this right. Let's leave, leave some out uh, and do some cross-validation on this. This is all cross-validation results. Um, and then we're ranking how often the models, these fancy models, we're using LASSO, which is a uh, a, a, a linear regression uh, approach uh, for multi multiple regression. Um, we're also using, uh, we've also tried uh, uh, decision tree approaches. So we're, we're looking at uh, 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 random forests and, uh, and other, other tools. Uh, and, and what we're finding is that some of the time we actually get news that tells us that we're not sure about what's going on. And what this is telling us is that these are the highest ranking things that actually predict the outcome of our patients now that we're putting them all in the thing. And we do this repeated uh, uh, bootstrapping to, to check to see how often um, we get the same result if we leave a subject out or we leave two subjects out, uh, and then we do cross-validation. So when, when that happens, these are the top ranking things. And if you notice, what's really interesting here is one of the factors was whether they got the treatment or whether they didn't get the treatment of error augmentation. And those don't appear on the top 10 list. There are actually about 15 on the list of uh, 50 some. So this is a, what I think of as a new way to cast doubt on things and to make sure we really know what we're talking about. I, I actually worry that, you know, that one of the advantages for uh, therapeutic intervention is that you're just asking the patient to get up in the morning and go to the clinic, as opposed to maybe not. Uh, and and, uh, and that's, that's a, a, a really interesting uh, concept, is, is I really have incredible doubts here. And I think these tools actually help us understand our doubts. Um, Does the chartreuse line on the left Mm -hmm. to like the distribution of the points like Actually, or what we want, so these are the top things that predict the outcome. So uh, Wolf Motor Function Score actually predicts, is one of the winners of predicting. So that's the top one. And then what we did, chose to do is show, and the dots don't really show up very well for these lines on the left. But what we wanted to do was look at just a pairwise correlation between the the outcome of Wolf and whatever one of these uh, is. So Wolf, initial Wolf motor function is highly correlated with, uh, anti-correlated actually with, with Wolf motor. So that's what those correlation lines, those are, these are these magenta lines.
lines that, that are showing. Magenta lines for height. I mean, height seems incredibly steep. Isn't that strange? Very short. Yeah. Like yeah. all the people are above the same. Well, yeah, so we're, well, and we're probably not doing a very good job of choosing our axis uh, scaling here because, you know, there's nobody with zero height and it probably, that prob plot probably goes to zero, zero. Uh, but it's highly correlated, right? So body height is one of the winners. Very crazy, right? Um, but what we think is our, our next frontier um, is, there's things you can do something about it here, and there's things you can't do something about, maybe. So we don't know whether these are causal, but uh, you know, one, of, one of the things that keeps coming up is speed. You know, so if uh, everything that John K Krakauer is talking about at, uh, you know, on stroke patients is, is important, and some of the other people out there, moving fast seems to be very interesting. Uh, uh, skill to have to, to lead to outcomes. So we think that's it. Yeah. So uh, if, if you look at people who, let's see if I can get this right. So it's negatively correlated, but the problem is the Wolf Motor Function exam, you get a lower score if you are better. Because the Wolf Motor Function exam is actually a test of how long it takes you to do things. Yeah, I was going to ask. Actually, I was going to say it for the idea. idea that you just had trajectory early on, but did you calculate speed when people went from one from the pool? Right. The point so the, there's lots of ways to there's lots of ways to calculate speed. Uh, we you know we have these tall buildings in Chicago. We say well, there's lots of ways to calculate how tall, right? Um, same same thing. So this is uh, you know so there's a lot of speed issues. There's speed peaks. There's Max speed. This is actually related to speed too. It's actually how, how often you slow down below a certain level that we call it the arrest period ratio. I have my friend Steve Scott to blame for that. He invented that term. Um, so, 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 but, but it's an interesting insight is that speed, I think, might be important. Now the next question is whether speed is something that you can change yeah. and have it lead to more beneficial outcomes, artificially change, right, with, with a robot, for example, or whether uh, it's actually uh, that you naturally have the ability to have, have, have speed, and because of that, you have more of, of an opportune chance to get better, right? So, so it's an interesting outcome that we're having, and we really are um, interested in these approaches because, n and, and, and you know, one of the things that's interesting is uh, that I, I need to point out on this is that you have to have a lot of variability in your data in order for you to kind of say, I've swept the space and understood what's going on here, okay? So that's one thing. And then the other is w we need more data, right? So, which is what every scientist would say, right? We need more data. So. Last slide, is it in the last slide? No, it's not the last slide, I'm sorry. It's a segue to the last slide, I think. Um, is the idea that, you know, there's a lot of criticism out there now. Um, so this is not me, this is, uh, you know, pe people much smarter than me who have been studying studies, right? They, they do research on research, right? And um, the idea is that uh, a lot of times the world of robotics especially has been about proving that the robot is at least as good as a therapist or something like that, you know, because we're going to replace therapists with robots or something like that. <laughs> Not true. So, um, but, but the important thing is that this is a lot like, you know, uh, a, a study where we're looking at aspirin versus Tylenol, right? And we're so trying to see whether something is not worse than the other. Uh, which is a really difficult statistical task, and it's hard. Um, so um, we end up with a handful of sand very often when we're when we're uh, doing these studies, and it's and it's a, a lot of wasted effort and time by many many researchers. Um, I shouldn't say wasted, but a lot of uh, fruitless results uh, in in a lot of studies, and it's also one of the reasons why I think. I, I'm, I'm one of those people who believes that clinical trials are not so great and that we should be looking for other ways to answer questions. So um, 
so what's next? Well, why isn't all of this working that well? Here's a list that we've kind of compiled over the year of, of why, over the years of why. So this is a bit like the who killed the electric car uh, kind of uh, idea in the, in the 1990s. They asked that question, why, why, did, uh, why did the electric car die? Well, it turns out it was a lot of little reasons that added up. Um, I think there's a lot of little reasons that really present challenges that add up in this field. And I'm not gonna go through all of these, but one of them is, of course, this idea of uh, low N, right? So how do we get around low N and actually encourage more variability than we might get by very restrictive inclusion and exclusion criteria in our clinical studies? And that is, um, of course, get more data. Uh, but maybe the possibility is this, this organic possibility of don't care how the data comes in, present a clinical environment that allows for a lot of data collection and harvest all of this data as it comes in and do something with it like what I was showing with the machine learning algorithms that actually tell us uh, how unsure we are about things. Um, and, and of course, if we end up with uh, certainty uh, about some things or at least hints about some things along the way we might we might actually uh, be able to go new directions so all of these these kind of bullets are really surrounding uh, this idea right uh, the therapeutic devices can um, maybe be explored as a tool that you put out uh, in the clinic for uh, therapists and patients to choose to use at, at their will, and uh, and uh, we end up harvesting data from that process as it happens. Not easy to get through IRB, probably, but uh, but uh, uh, all, but also a nice idea. Okay, so I think that's it. I'm going to be finished, and uh, you know, oh, and I guess the, the cute thing is to say that I think we have an environment, I think you do too here, uh, in several places, uh, where, where uh, you know, you have this environment where this type of thing is possible. Um, and uh, so, um, let's see, so I, I'm going to jump ahead, I think this is, this is fine, and just uh, take questions now. So thank you. Tasks, your straight line endpoint acquisition tasks. Have you have you taken the next step and shown how that relates to function in the home environment or in an unconstrained? Yeah. So it, it, this is a real tough one. Specificity yeah. Specificity of training and are you? Yeah. You so. Get good at so, so one problem is, Ron, I, I, is, and we talked about this yesterday, is walking is really easy to know uh, if someone's walking better, right? Because you just measure walking, right? If I try to talk about the upper extremity, I have trouble, right? And uh, those of you who do upper extremities, like, what, how, do you, how do you quantify quality of outcome? Um, and you know, I, I've, I'll throw that out to the group. What we're left with is maybe the, cl the validated clinical measures that are available that, the, that the, the therapy community and others have actually said are the way to measure outcome, um, which is crazy for us engineers because we say, oh no, we can do this better. You know, we've got machines now and we can do this better. But the problem is, uh, and, and many of you may know this, is there's a, been a huge European initiative to come up with new measures that are better, uh, that, that, uh, that a bunch of clinical uh, and bioengineers in Europe have, have really teamed up to, to, to come up with. And it's a consortium, and it's been going for about six or seven years now. And they've come up with nothing because it, you can add, you can put a bunch of clinicians in the room and say what's the best way to measure outcome, and they'll argue, right? But if you put a bunch of engineers in a room and you ask the same question, they argue so badly that it's uh, it's a it's a it's a horrible mess. So we we really don't have the tools, uh, or, or or maybe it's that we have too many tools and not one is is emerging as the, the clear choice, right? 
So you can, you can do a huge battery of tests on people and say, well, we have five or six different metrics on their outcome and present those. That's, that's the best we can do. So it's kind of like a multi, multi what do you call it, a MANOVA. Right. right. But maybe I should be asking this group, because uh, I'm sure there's a lot of really great people here who might have better opinions about this. What do we do to measure outcomes? Yeah. I thought you answered that, but yeah. Yeah, I was, you weren't going to, I thought you were going to answer it. No, OK. <laughs> yeah. So even if we all come up and agree that there is this perfect ADL test for the cyber problem, and that it's done in a standardized way, and that it standardized environment, Clinicians are also going to ask, so, okay, so if you're going to do that in a standardized, idealized environment, how do we know that's what they're going to do when we get out in real life? And WHO has a nomenclature. It's called performance versus capacity. The capacity is, is really what they do in the lab in an idealized, standardized measure supervising. Okay? And that they have no relevance to actual performance. That's what do they actually do in, in real life. Right. And of course, people talk about, well, let's put some uh, wearable sensors. Well, if you know that you have a wearable sensor on, how do you avoid the pocket of all these individuals? So there are a lot of technical and theoretical issues to measure these things uh, outside. In real life, that's relevant. Take it yeah, out. and I, I think the, the new wearable technology is going to get better and better, and there may be some opportunities there. We're working with John Rogers, who has you know nice band-aids that you put on, and they they collect data, you know, and you don't you don't have to worry about them too much. That's neat, uh, but you're right. There's there's it, it's it's a very tough uh, tough world, but yeah, that's a that's a nice frontier. Is 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 all of that? Is what happens when you go home, and and can you measure something there? The Wolf Motor Function Exam is actually trying to do that. It's actually trying to get at functional type of activities. But I, I'm sure, as you know, it's it, it's unfulfilling, right? Yeah. I had another we, question you, you you're, you're hogging the room. No, I'm just <laughs> Dustin. Want, Dustin wants to go. Okay, sir. I, I graciously yield yeah. the floor to Dr. <laughs> go ahead. To me, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. What's, what's, what's the question? I'm your, sorry. Uh, your area amplification uh, strategy yeah. seemed to me to be a lot like resistance training. And I was wondering, since you're kind of amplifying the opposite motion that you want uh -huh. to encourage. So I want to draw on the board, but I'm not going to draw. And, and I, want to, I want to know if you've thought about separating the effects of maybe preferentially strengthening uh -huh. uh, those movements and you know its effects versus you know how is that kind of so so resistance resistance training is is a form maybe of error augmentation or it's a relative of error augmentation so if you know that means that I've been going to the weight room you know my whole life and trying trying to get bigger and stronger, and maybe it's helped, I don't know. But uh, the error augmentation is actually most of the time about a, a direction perpendicular to that. So if, I, if I'm moving uh, this way, I might resist you by pushing back. But you can imagine uh, vectors of force now that are perpendicular, maybe not necessarily completely perpendicular, but but to the side, I'm making a mistake to the to the side usually, and the, and that's what the problem is. So I'm I'm amplifying that, and I'm selectively amplifying it really carefully. I'm actually measuring it accurately and pushing you in the direction of your error. Does that make sense? And and you can so so it's different, uh, but it's probably part of the same family of things that you can do you can do. So you know I what I didn't do was give credit to. Uh, to David Rankinsmeyer, who came up with this idea of assist as needed, uh, which is really a, a, a nice idea, too. It's maybe more of a fundamental uh, concept. Is, is this assist or resist, depending on how much the patient actually can make the movement themselves, right? So people who are completely paretic uh, might need help moving. And it might still be good for them to help them move. 
And I'm leaving those people out with their augmentation. So I have a question about your velocity issues. First of all, I wonder about the variability of velocity as they train over time in that point mm -hmm. reaching point. But if you try to like slow the dot down, like or effectively moving the target further and further away, so that as somebody gets faster at the task, you make the target further away, so it takes them the same amount of time to get to the target. I mean, is that an error that you? Uh, so now you're talking about maybe progressive challenge of the task, well, right? Yeah, is that is that what you're talking about? The, yeah. Uh, so so moving a lever, just slow down how much the dot moves compared yeah. to the. Right. Lever. So you're chasing this dot, but you have to remember, I'm allowing the therapist to choose where that dot is, right? right. So the therapist is saying, oh, this person needs to have no, a I'm slower right. challenge. Very early. Oh, the very early. Yeah. Very early. Okay. Just reaching for a target. Yeah. So reaching for a target, we actually. Uh, the target appears, right. so it's, a, it's, it's, it's true targeted reaching where, where the target appears and you're not pursuing a target, you're, right. you're actually so doing asking, discrete movement. So as you do the resistive training, uh -huh. do they get faster at reaching the target? Ah, yeah, okay, so the, the original study on that uh, for hel in healthy people was, yeah, they get a little faster um, as they train. They actually get a little faster even when they're initially exposed to, to forces because um, I think it elevates anxiety a little bit um, uh, and, and just makes people naturally faster. But the big goal a lot of the time in those experiments, as ma and many of the neuroscientists who play this game know, is we give you uh, a pacing feedback after each movement to try to control for velocity. We're just, you know, we can let a lot of things vary, but in that, those experiments, we're, we're trying to play the old high school game of have one variable and try to keep everything else constant. So, so it's, it's about trying to keep people moving, so. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Gift for okay, you. thank uh, you. Photos yeah. from Cleveland, so you can remember. All right, thank you. Cleveland and your visit here. All right, thank so you. Thank you again. <laughs>